Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. It's nice to have you with us this morning. My name is Brian Kiley, and I'll be the minister. I'll be your minister today. So welcome to our flight. We hope that you feel welcome here. The Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of world community. So whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here today. We respectfully acknowledge that we meet on the traditional Cree lands that are now part of Treaty 6 territory. It is a historic gathering place for many indigenous peoples, and it has many histories, languages, and cultures worked into the soil of this place. So we're glad to have you with us this morning. We hope that you find something in our service today. It's the beginning of uh, three weeks of exploring the traditions of Buddhism. So we hope you find something here today that speaks to your spirit and helps you find balance. Free from suffering. May all sentient beings be well and enjoy the root of happiness. Free from suffering and the root of suffering. May they not be separated from the joy beyond sorrow. May they dwell in spacious equanimity, free from craving, fear, and ignorance. Before I begin the first of these uh, three sermons, I want to acknowledge kind of where I got the idea from. When I was a very young, almost Unitarian, I hadn't even joined, I used to attend the Unitarian Church Montreal where Charles Edis was the minister, and Charles was a fabulous teacher. And he was the one who decided in that case that it would be the month of February each year was devoted to a different world religious tradition. And I learned more from those four years of sermons than I did in any of my theology classes, because he always made them clear and simple to understand. So I hope I'm following in his footsteps. But here's to you, Charles. Buddhism begins with a man. In his later years, when India was afire with his message, people came to him asking him what he was. Not, who are you, but what are you? Are you a god, they asked? No. An angel? No. A saint? Nope. Then, what are you? And the Buddha replied, I am awake. His answer became his title, for that's what Buddha means. The Sanskrit root, bud, means to awake and to know. The belief goes like this. While the rest of humanity is dreaming the dream we call the waking human state, one of our number managed to rouse himself. And so Buddhism begins with a man who woke up. Now, the man, the prince, was Siddhartha Gautama. He was born around the year 563 BCE in the northwest corner of India near present-day Nepal. His father, as I said earlier, was a minor king. So Siddhartha grew up in an atmosphere of power and wealth and privilege. He wanted for nothing. And as with any religious figure of import, a legend sprang up around his life. Whether it's factual or not, we cannot say. But like all such mythic legends, the story reveals the truths of the faith. So, as I mentioned in the children's story, the fortune tellers promised at his birth that Siddhartha would be a great figure. But there was some ambiguity. If he stayed engaged with the world, he would become a great king and a world conqueror. But if he dropped out, to use that vernacular of the 60s, or became disillusioned, he would become a great teacher. So, his father, who wanted him to be the great king, interpreted this fortune as meaning he had to keep his son happy and away from the world at all costs. For fear that the boy would see something unpleasant, he kept the child in splendid isolation, the world's original gilded cage. And there were palaces, and there were dancers, and musicians, and fine food, and every possible pleasure at his disposal. 
And when he left the palace, runners were sent ahead of him to clear the road of any unpleasant sight. As you might expect, there came a day when the runners failed to do their job. And on one journey, Prince Siddhartha sought not one, but four distressing sights. Buddhism loves numbers. The four distressing sights. First, he encountered an old man, gaunt with broken teeth and bent over his walking stick. He'd never seen such a thing. When he asked what it was, he was told, Age, my lord, age. Next, he came across a body that was lying in the road, racked with sickness. What is that? he asked. That is disease, my prince. Then he encountered a corpse. And that? That is death, my lord. Finally, he encountered a monk with a shaved head and a saffron robe and a begging bowl. Who is that? Someone renouncing the world and seeking inner peace, my Lord. The four passing sights transformed the young prince. It reminds me a little bit of young people, which once upon a time I was, uh, growing up and finally becoming aware of the world around them, of politics, of poverty, of those sorts of things, and how at some point we all encounter disillusionment in our lives. It's really a very human story. But... His encounter with the four passing sights forced him to come to terms with age and with the disintegration of the body, with death, and with people who are trying to find fulfillment on a spiritual plane. Really, this was his first bit of awakening, that what we see and experience in our sheltered lives is not the full scope of reality. So... At the age of 29, he shaved his head and went off to become an ascetic monk and search for enlightenment. But, like, all, like many keeners, he became more ascetic than most. He nearly starved himself to death, but he didn't find enlightenment. So, he learned the futility of extremism, of asceticism. That was the second illusion that was shattered for him. And so, he chose the middle way between the extremes of asceticism and indulgence. And the middle way would shape everything that would form his philosophy. He took up the Hindu meditative form called Raja Yoga. Remember, the Indian subcontinent was almost entirely Hindu in those days. It was one of his many influences. And after six years of disciplined meditation, this is a meditative form of yoga, Raja Yoga, rather than stretching and looking like downward dogs. This is a meditative form. And after six years of very disciplined meditation and sensing a breakthrough was near, he went at nightfall and sat under a bow tree vowing not to arise until he had gained enlightenment. He was tormented through the night with visions of voluptuous women and by fireballs thrown at him by the god Mara. But he outlasted the god. And by dawn, his consciousness, quote, pierced the world's bubble, collapsing it to nothing, only to find it restored with true being. This is called the Great Awakening. Siddhartha Gautama was gone. He was replaced by the Buddha. And for the next 50 years that he remained on earth, he was sought to help others find enlightenment. He founded an order of monks, a Sangha, as they're called, and he renounced Brahmanism, his caste order of Hindu society. You may recall that the Hindu society was very, very structured according to caste, Brahmins being the highest and on the way down, and they did not cross-associate. Well, he renounced Brahmanism and caste order. And he became very active. He ran his order of monks. He taught, he preached, and counseled. But each year, he would go away for three months for private meditation. And three times every day, he would retire from his activities for a period of meditation as well. We might all take a lesson on the importance of stepping away from work once in a while and tending to our own spiritual lives. He died kind of ignominiously, maybe embarrassingly, from eating poison mushrooms. 
His last words, however, were, All compounds grow old. Work out your own salvation with diligence. Well, many stories survive about the Buddha. He was a cool rationalist, but one with a warm and sympathetic heart. Kind of reminds me a bit when I hear stories of the Dalai Lama today. Every problem that came to him was analyzed rationally, but then his responses were warmed with compassion. Buddhism is sometimes labeled a religion of infinite compassion. The strength of his character, his noble manner, the fact that he gave up wealth and privilege combined with the intensity of his mission, all those things won him converts in heavy, heavy numbers, not just in India, but soon throughout all of Asia. Unlike the founders of most faiths, the Buddha knew from the get-go what he was doing. He was intending to attract followers to his path. Not to become more famous, but to help others find enlightenment. That's the role of the Bodhisattva, the saint in Buddhism. Well, no religion pops up out of thin air. Buddhism arose out of Hinduism, but it developed very quickly on its own. And the Buddha, who was a reformer as much as anything else, seeking to strip away layers of ritual and caste structure that he felt ruined Hinduism, and was seeking to reach a level of truth and broad equality. And in so doing, he created really a non-religion in many ways, a path without the traditional elements. First, his religion was devoid of authority. He challenged the monopoly of the Brahmins and encouraged people to take responsibility for their own lives. Do not accept what you hear by report. Be ye lamps unto yourselves. Sound familiar for Unitarians? Secondly, he preached a religion that was devoid of ritual. In fact, he ridiculed Hindu rituals. Third, religion is usually used to explain how the world came to be and why things happen. But the Buddha skipped all of that and preached a religion of speculation about the nature of world and life and death and all those good questions. The Buddha maintained a noble silence. He bypassed tradition. Do not go by what is handed down, nor by the authority of traditional teaching. When you know of yourselves these teachings are good or not good, only then accept or reject them. He preached a religion of intense self-effort. There was no grace that would intervene. There was no benevolent presence out there to comfort us and answer all the questions. It was going to all be your own work. And finally, he preached a religion without a supernatural figure. He condemned divination and magic. I suspect those of you who have been around the Unitarian Church for a while recognize and applaud and feel very comfortable with most of those tenets. In its evolution, Buddhism has developed a set of simple and easily remembered touchstones. It's very well organized, really well organized. We've already heard of the four passing sites. The foundation of the tradition are the four noble truths. Dukkha. Ordinary existence is a state of suffering. Dukkha. There are the usual physical sufferings. Then there is the suffering of impermanence. The sure knowledge that nothing in this life lasts forever. The third dukkha is mental suffering caused by conditioning of the mind. It's the worst of the sufferings because it leads to negative attitudes, which leads to wrong actions and eventually to rebirth in one of the lower realms. Reincarnation is a part of Buddhism. And if you kind of screw it up this time, you drop down the ladder but if you live your life well and seek enlightenment, you move on up. Eventually, getting to enlightenment and you don't have to come back anymore. Second, the arising of dukkha or the causes of suffering. Suffering is caused by an ignorant state of mind. We are fooled into thinking that the things around us are real. I'm not talking about tables, chairs, birth, and all that stuff. I'm talking about status and power and wealth are not real things. All those things we measure to try and decide if we're better than somebody else. 
Those are illusions, like the temptations that beset Buddha sitting under the bow tree. And we develop attachments to these false things. We believe and we crave false realities. And that gives rise to our mental suffering. I heard a piece on day six yesterday in CBC where they were talking about marketing and how they're talking about drop day marketing, trying to manufacture a scarcity for a new product that started with Nike Air Jordan shoes and and has gone now to all kinds of companies that try and say, oh man, this incredible product is coming, but it's going to be gone soon. So you've got to rush out and get it. And, and everybody rushes out and get it because they have this false illusion that this is actually important, what kind of shoes they wear. Interesting how this, this Buddhist concept of dukkha and attachments plays out in the world. Third noble truth is the cessation of dukkha. Suffering is ended by renouncing the negative mind and false attachments. Ah, there you go, done. Suffering is ended by developing real compassion for all human beings. This brings liberation and peace of mind. It allows the creation of harmony between oneself and one's environment. And the only method, finally, that one can attain this liberation is by following the teachings of the Buddha in, we have four, now the Eightfold Path. But be warned, it will take you many lifetimes of effort. So the Eightfold Path. This is my last list. The Buddha approached life like a physician when he was at the Four Noble Truths. First, he lists the symptoms, then the diagnosis of the cause, and finally, he prescribes a remedy, the Eightfold Path. It is a course of treatment in the form of self-training with a moral aim. But before starting on these eight steps, there is a preparatory step that goes unmentioned. It's right association. Any physician will tell you that the first step in healing is removing the source that's causing the symptoms. In a moral world where our own desires for private fulfillment are the cause of distress, we must try to associate with those who are renouncing such desires. Or to put it another way, you don't send a drug addict to a crack house in order to start rehabilitation. So, right understanding is the first One has to grasp the problem before one can seek to cure it. And studying the truths opens one to change. Right intention is the second step. Once we understand the problem, we have to decide what we're going to do about it. Are we ready to direct ourselves onto the path of enlightenment and put aside distractions of desire? Until we're single-minded about that, we're not going to get very far. The next three steps are called the ethical disciplines. Right speech calls us to look at what we say, to notice what it reveals about our character. Instead of promising to tell the truth, we have to start noticing how many times a day we feel like not telling the truth. And when we do that, we will probably discover that we are lying to cover something soft and weak about ourselves. As well, our speech should proceed towards compassion. Once we begin to notice what we say, false witness, crude or uncharitable gossip and the like will begin to drop away. By monitoring and then changing speech, we begin to change ourselves. Our Unitarian First Principle calls us to affirm the worth and dignity of every person. That's always felt like it butts up against this idea of right speech. If we're intentional, about affirming another person's worth and dignity, if we're intentional about speaking with compassion, then a lot of the negative stuff begins to drop away. The fourth step follows, obviously, from right speech, and that's right action. The Buddha detailed this in the five precepts that constitute the Buddhist version of the Ten Commandments. Do not kill, do not steal, do not lie, do not be unchaste, do not drink or take drugs. That's simple and straightforward. Follow those actions and you'll be on the right path. The fifth comes right livelihood. I like that he included livelihood. Buddha believed one's occupation could become too distracting and keep you from the path. Quote, the hand of the dyer is subdued in the dye in which it works. When one gets far enough along the path, Participation in a monastic sangha may be in order, but for the lay person, it points to finding work that promotes life instead of destroying it. 
that promotes reality instead of illusions. The Buddha even outlined professions that were incompatible with the path. Drug peddler, slave trader, prostitute, butcher, brewer, arms maker, and tax collector. In his day, that was a corrupt line of work, unlike in Canada, where they're merely incompetent. Sorry, did I mention I'm having a problem with the CRA? Never mind. (laughs) The last three steps involve a mental discipline. Sixth is right effort. The Buddha placed tremendous stress on moral exertion. While the goal was ultimately to free the mind, one did not achieve it by simply emptying it. It took hard work. It takes an effort of will and a great deal of discipline to begin this path. One has to stop those things which are harmful or distracting, but oh, so attractive and habitual for us. We are addicted to the illusions of this life, and to turn away from them takes a great deal of mental discipline. We have to force ourselves into a different way of thinking. Seventh is right mindfulness. The Buddha was one of the most rational of all the religious founders. He respected the human mind. In fact, the magical story about his birth, that wasn't his. That came long after he died. He didn't deal in magic or divination. The best love Buddhist text, the Dhammapada, opens with the words, all we are is the result of all we have thought. All we are is the result of all we have thought. That's worth contemplation. Ignorance, not sin, is the primary adversary in Buddhism. To gradually overcome ignorance, the Buddha counsels continuous self-examination until self-awareness begins to liberate us. The more we know why we do what we do, the more likely we are to be able to free ourselves from that very behavior. But this is full-time work. Moods and emotions are to be noticed, non-reactively, not about, oh, here I am thinking that again, but just go, oh, all right. I'm getting angry with this situation, or I'm getting sad with this situation, or I'm getting whatever with this situation. Hmm, think about that. The mind must control the senses and impulses, not be controlled by them. Finally, there is number eight, known very widely in its Zen form. The concept is called right concentration. And it involves long periods of sitting and meditation, learning to let go of distractions and to focus the minds. Well, that's the Buddhist tradition that he founded. But for many of us, as we were discussing, many of us will have different spiritual practices that occupy the body and allow the mind its freedom to soar in spirituality. I can't do Zen sitting. I try to use to fall asleep all the time. For me, I have to have some kind of action involved, like Tai Chi or cycling or something of that sort. The focusing of the mind then becomes absorbed on the task until, like Buddha under the bow tree, it breaks through to enlightenment. Well, that's the core of Buddhism as it began. And you can see how it was attractive for early Unitarians like Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. It was logical. It was rational. It involved deep self-examination of one's actions and, most importantly, one's motives. It included a great deal of personal responsibility and it provided tools for self-perfection and self-examination and produced a path towards good and healthy living. In a less disciplined way, our current Unitarian Universalist Statement of Principles calls us to many of the same goals. So next week, we'll pick it up again and we'll look at how Buddhism split and divided and moved around the world in many, many different ways and take a look at some of the practices. Thank you. I have a brief meditation. It's called the Metta Karuna Prayer. O Amida, one of the Japanese names for the Buddha, oneness of life and light, entrusting in your great compassion, may you shed the foolishness in myself, transforming me into a conduit of love. May I be a medicine for the sick and weary, nursing their afflictions until they are cured. May I become food and drink during time of famine. May I protect the helpless and poor. May I be a lamp for those in need of your light. 
May I be a bed for those who need rest and guide all seekers to the other shore. May all find happiness through my actions and let no one suffer because of me. Whether they love or hate me, whether they hurt or wrong me, may they all obtain true entrusting through other power and realize supreme nirvana. Namaste Amida Buddha.